It's off and show. We're on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app and streaming live on YouTube at the Team 980. Huge thanks to Daryl Tapp for swinging through and a huge thanks to Mitch Tischler uh, for being flexible with us. Uh, he joins us now on the phone. Uh, Mitchell, hello and, and thank you and, and I'm sorry about that, but uh, all of a sudden they were like, Daryl can come now and you, you know how that goes around here. Oh, certainly, and that Daryl Tapp interview was a ton of fun to listen to. So, always good to hear him out. Always, always good to hear that stuff. Yeah, I can't wait to get into the uh, the coaching effort thing later in the show. Honestly, that's all I've wanted to talk about today. I'm doing I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm talking about the day that Jaden Daniels had and all of that stuff. But coach, you can't coach effort. Come on, we, you can coach effort. You coach JP every single day on the podcast, Mitch. <laughs> listen, you're right. You can't coach effort, but the the fact that everyone's pretty much all bought in is pretty dang impressive i mean you know from the coaching staff and that you know free practice you know run through the bag you see all those guys jumping up and down and 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 being involved in it and you know it transfers onto the field they were doing the uh, field goal kicking today and the entire offense and defense john allen was you know one inch behind the kicker screaming in his ear all giving him a, a hard time trying to give him a game day look and having guys you know in willing to you know play the game and, and, and be involved in practice. You know, John Allen's not involved in special teams, but he's out there right in the middle of it with the rest of the guys, you know, giving him a real game, game like, game like look. And it's fun to see. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, really, really fun to see. And they did a phenomenal job uh, today of kind of doing that, giving that look and Hey, that, that kicker that that's barely on the team. Uh, they, they got him to, to make the field goal uh, walking off. So we love that. Uh, nobody cares about the kicker. Well, eventually people will care about the kicker. We're going to talk about the quarterback. Mitchell, two days in a row, Jaden Daniels is, the, uh, is QB1. How significant do we think that is at this point in the calendar? I mean, I guess if Mariota's the, the guy tomorrow, then who cares? But it, like, how many days in a row does, does Jaden Daniels have to be QB1 before we go, hey, guys, I think, I think Jaden Daniels is QB1. I think Jaden Daniels is QB1. I mean, I think even with when Marcus Mariota was taking those first reps, we knew that Jaden was going to eventually take over, and I think we've seen it. And I think it, it it adds to it that Marcus Mariota hasn't had a particularly good uh, mini camp. Out. But certainly it hasn't all been perfect, but he's a young quarterback, and that's kind of the way that, that things go with young quarterbacks. But – the ball not doesn't hit the ground very often when he's when he's in there, and more so you just see him you know placing the ball so nicely for these receivers and and running backs and tight ends. He gets the ball to them in places where they can make the catch and keep and uh, turn it upfield and make a play. Very rarely do you see these guys breaking stride or having to reach back for balls, and you know I think that's a, that's going to be a big part of this offense because we know Cliff Kingsbury wants to you know spread the field both horizontal horizontally and vertically. But he wants to get the ball out quickly and get the ball into his playmaker's hands. And Jane's done a really good job of that. And then on the other side of it, what you know, maybe even more impressive to me is watching Jaden work within the pocket. You know, you're not getting a real pass rush because the guys aren't in full pads, but when he's rolling out, he's so accurate uh, on the move with the football. And the ball comes out 
so quickly. It's just kind of a flick of the wrist, and uh, and it's, it's been impressive to watch. And certainly the balls uh, along the sidelines have been the ones that have been the most impressive because he does such a good job of keeping ball up and away from any DB that might be challenging a receiver and basically puts the ball up in a place where either his guy's going to make the play or no one is at all. Totally. And you and I were talking about this on the sideline today. His improv ability, I think, may have been underrated during the draft process, in part because Caleb Williams is one of the great improvers we've ever seen as a prospect, and that was the guy that was going ahead of him. And then Drake May, his highlights were so high as an improv guy. Like his, He just can make throws that are extraordinarily rare that Jaden flicking a ball, rolling to his right 40 yards accurately, and like you said, with, with great trajectory up and away, it's like, yeah, those other guys can do that too. But it's like that's the thing that you actually need in the NFL. You actually need to be able to make that throw. And sure, three times a year is Drake May going to throw the ball 60 yards across his body and, and you know one of those will be a touchdown. Great, but like that doesn't overcome the, the basic stuff that Drake struggles with. And, and as a result, like that, the highlight tapes kind of get compared. And I, I do kind of wonder if we undersold or it was undersold to us, however you want to look at it, uh, the, the improbability that Jaden has beyond the, the scrambling ability as a runner. Well, and I think that's, you know, that's all part of it. When you look at the pre-draft process, the big highlight plays are the ones where he tucks it and runs for 40 yards and, you know, is dusting SEC uh, DBs down the field as he's getting into the end zone. But, you know, the most important plays that you need to see are kind of those improv plays when you're able to take it from first and 10 to second and five instead of second and 10 or second and 13 if you're going to take a sack and, you know, obviously, again, no pads, so you only take so much away from it. But the, we, we saw the highlight plays of him tucking and running, and I think folks fell in love with his speed. I think that's where a lot of the kind of RG3 comparisons came from, the fact that he can run so well. But he runs as a last resort, and to me that's impressive because he's a quarterback that has his head on his shoulders, and when he's spinning out of the pocket and running or getting out of the pocket, he's looking to still make a play downfield with his arms and only as a last resort is he then tucking it and and uh, and trying to run. And the fact that he's able to make so many plays on the move, and whether it's rolling to his right, you know, with his arm angle, or to the left having to throw across his body, he's able to get himself into a good throwing position, deliver the ball, you know, in the right place with with a good with a good velocity on it. I mean, Terry McLaurin talked about it a little bit yesterday about how he's been working with the receivers to you know get their heads turned around quickly on on these routes because. You know, other quarterbacks might wait for a a receiver to clear and get into the open portion of the field, whether it's a zone or a man or whatever it may be, whereas Jaden is more willing to throw him open. And, you know, you hear that in the NFL a lot, and I think it's hard for kind of a casual fan maybe to quantify what a quarterback is throwing a receiver open. But I think the more that we get to watch Jaden, I think the more that you're going to be able to conceptualize and understand, you know, the fact that if he's throwing that, you know, an in-breaker to Terry – and he's feathering it over a linebacker in front of a safety before Terry gets to that open, you know, portion of the zone. He gives Terry an opportunity to beat everybody there, catch the ball, and go. And uh, and it's been impressive to watch. And you've seen a lot of these plays be, you know, guys catch the ball, and they're able to turn the ball upfield, and they're able to, you know, get another 10, 15 yards before a, uh, a defender is able to touch them or, or tag them up. Um, and so, you know, I just, I've really liked what I've seen from him, and we've seen it more and more as the offseason season has progressed, and, and I think that's an important step, you know, seeing kind of that day-to-day improvement, the, the 1% better each day. No doubt. Uh, Mitch Tischler, co-host of the Beltway Football Podcast with us here on the Hoffman Show. We saw some mix-up on the O-line today, Mitch. Uh, Brandon Coleman out at left tackle, Michael Dieter at left guard. Um, it, my guess is they, they did the Dieter at left guard thing so that Nick Allegretti could get reps at center with the twos as they cross-train everybody, and, and they wanted Allegretti to get some reps at center. But what do we make of that when Ricky Stromberg is still floating around a third-round pick just last year? Yeah, I think you saw a lot today was about trying to get guys in different positions. Uh, during OTAs, we saw a couple times Cornelius Lucas would be at left tackle with the with the first group, and then when they went to the second group O line, Big Luke would go over and play right tackle. And um, I think they're trying to get him some work on both sides, but ultimately, you know, I think that kind of wears you out when he's the starting left tackle and then has to go over and 
play second team right tackle. So I think it was a little bit of a preservation early on in camp, getting uh, Brandon Coleman that work over on the left side. I think when we get to training camp, we're going to see Cornelius Lucas with the first team uh, offensive line at least to start, and it will be an opportunity for Brandon Coleman to, to work his way in there. But certainly when you talk about the center position and the fact that Ricky Stromberg is still working pretty strongly with the threes and hasn't really made a lot of a lot of move up. We've seen Michael Dieter take some center snaps, Nick Allegretti uh, today. I, I just think it speaks to kind of the stunting of Stromberg's growth that he had last year, and it's unfortunate, but it's a very real thing. I mean, he was a center his entire college career, and, you know, last year I talked to him when they started working with him at guard, and Ricky was like, hey, man, I haven't really taken real reps at guards in high school. And the fact that they immediately – kind of moved him over to guard and had him start taking the work there, stunted his growth as a center and as a and as a football player because he was learning essentially a brand new position. And I think we're seeing that now where it's, you know, he's coming off injury, plus he's coming off a year where he didn't get the 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 growth and the learning that you would have hoped that he would have had. And I think it's taken him a little time to uh to make some hay here. But certainly, you know, there's some there's some uh comfortability, I guess, with guys like Michael Dieter and Nick Allegretti who have you know, been in the NFL a little bit longer, played a couple of different positions. You know, they've, they've shown that they can be starters, that they can be backups, that they can play guard and center. And, you know, I think much like we talk about Brandon Coleman, you know, trying to work his way into that, you know, starting left tackle role, I think Ricky Stromberg is going to be trying to work hard to work into that backup center role. And ultimately, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this O-line plays out because you have a pretty good idea of who probably nine of the ten O-linemen are and there's going to be a battle at the back with a lot of names that Commanders fans have gotten to know. You know, Chris Paul, Ricky Stromberg, Mason Brooks, Braden Daniels. You know, those are all guys that are going to be fighting for probably that last O-line spot, um, you know, on this roster. And I think that O-line is one position where you're going to see it. But I think across the board, you're going to see some draft picks in the last two, three years, you know, that fans obviously were hoping to that would, you know, turn into good players, but ultimately – haven't really done a lot, are going to be fighting for a spot on this roster. And ultimately, that's a good thing. I think, you know, if you're able to, to cut good players, that puts you in a – that means your roster is starting to show a little bit of depth to it. You're starting to get a little bit deeper. You're starting to get to a situation where if one guy gets hurt, it doesn't ruin the entire team. So, uh, you know, Ricky, Ricky Stromberg is going to have a lot of work to do to, to fight his way onto this roster. But, uh, you know, it's, it's ultimately, I think, comes from – uh, some of the mismanagement that, that he saw early in his career. Uh, what have you made of Coleman so far, and what did you see from him today? He's able to get out in space a little bit. I think you see the athleticism. Also, I, I got uh, I was within like 10 feet of the dude yesterday. That's a big freaking man. That is a large human being. But what, what have you seen from Brandon Coleman, left tackle and otherwise, so far? He, he is a very big body. Um, he's, he's super quick. I mean, you know, the RAS score stuff, wasn't lying. When we see him on the field, you see that uh, that lateral movement, and and it's strong. I think you know the big thing is going to be when they put pads on and they can rush for real. You get a feel if his punch can be you know in concert with his feet, and he can keep his balance and and use that athleticism to help kind of stonewall some of these uh, edge rushers. But he's looked pretty good. I mean, you know, again, there's only so much you can really tell on an O lineman without without pads on. He did have uh, one ball start today at practice, but ultimately I think as a whole he's looked good. I think he's shown that, you know, that athleticism isn't just kind of gym athleticism, it's football athleticism, and you see it on the football field. And I think that, uh, you know, he's got a really good base to start with. I, I think that, uh, you know, talking to Cornelius Lucas and some of the other O-linemen as they've been coming off the field, you know, they're excited about what he can be because he does show kind of those early those early things that you want to see you know, from uh, left tackles, from, you know, athletic guys. And uh, it'll be once they put pads on to see how he handles himself, you know, when he takes a bull rush or, you know, how he's able to, to convert some of that athleticism into play strength. We all know that the false start that he had today was John Kimes fault though, Mitch. We were, we were watching him. We're like, all right, let's watch Coleman on this rep. And as soon as we did, when Kimes the one who said it, jumped off sides. So the false start wasn't even his fault. It was Kimes. Oh, yeah, there's no one else to blame but cut with, but time. But you mentioned kind of him getting downfield. That first play of 11-on-11 11 11 was a quick little screen pass to the right, and 
as uh, I, I believe it was Austin Eckler was making his way downfield. <laughs> Brandon Coleman was step for step with him uh, as he was trying to get out in front of him to, to make blocks. And for me, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I love to see for my O linemen. You know, Nick Gates obviously wasn't the center that everyone had hoped that he would be. But the one thing that I really liked that he did was he was a guy that blocked kind of through the echo of the whistle and particularly downfield. Whenever they ran any sort of uh, screen or quick game, he was always looking to pick off somebody at the end of those plays. And I think that, you know, that's how you can turn a, a 20 yard play into a 60 yard touchdown when you get those big guys out front. And between him and Sam Cosme and Tyler Biotish, I mean, there's some, there's some solid athleticism on this O line. And particularly with the, the amount of quick game that we know Cliff Kingsbury is going to run, I think there's going to be some opportunities for those guys to get downfield and, uh, get a couple pancakes on some uh, smaller guys. No, I think that's a great point, Mitch. And, and actually, I think it's why when people discount Trent Scott as a potential placeholder, not just Cornelius Lucas at left tackle, I think you might be underselling that. We've seen Trent Scott run with the one some uh, this spring, and it's because he's more athletic. Like, Lucas is a gigantic human who is relatively stationary. He is a, he's a very good pass blocker. He's very hard to beat because he's a mountain of a man to get around. Uh, he's got good enough feet in the phone booth, good enough hands, and he's obviously strong as, as hell because he's six foot eight and 340 pounds or whatever he is. Uh, but getting him out in space is, not, is, is kind of, I don't want to say it's a non-starter, but it's, it's certainly not his specialty. And I think is the kind of thing that has kept him more of a swing tackle role versus being someone that is coveted as a starter, despite the fact that he's been in the league for quite a number of years now. And so if Coleman can win that spot, you get the best of both worlds. You get the gigantic human who's hard to pass rush and can also move. But I do wonder if Scott winds up winning the job week one if they think Coleman's not ready yet because of the fact that Cliff wants to get guys out in space and that is not Lucas's specialty. Yeah, I think Lucas is, is a little bit more of a, of a throwback tackle. I mean, we can think back to the days that uh, Trent Williams was here, and he was one of the few tackles that was in the NFL at that time that was getting out downfield to go, you know, get linebackers and get, uh, get DBs in the, uh, in the, in the screen game. Because, quite frankly, that wasn't what tackles were particularly asked to do, you know, even rewinding five, ten years in the NFL. But nowadays, you're seeing a lot more teams use a lot of that quick game and using those offensive linemen to get out front. And, yeah, that is something that I, I do think Brandon Coleman has an edge over Cornelius Lucas at. However, he's got to prove that he can be the mountain of a man of a pass blocker that Lucas is because, quite frankly, the most important thing is going to be protecting uh, is going to be protecting Jaden Daniels' blind side. And you need somebody who works well in the phone booth and – can be a guy that can be a stalwart in the past game. And if Brandon Coleman doesn't can't show that right away, I think that's really the pathway for big Luke to be your, your early season starter. And that might be something that, that Coleman has to kind of mature his way into and learn along the way. So I do think there's a bright future for Brandon Coleman, but I don't think fans should be expecting necessarily that week one, he's going to be that guy on the left side. I, I do think that, that Cornelius Lucas and his, and his, uh, veteran savvy and ability to the pass block is going to prove to be an important weapon for this team. No doubt. Uh, last thing for Mitch Tischler, of course, co-host of the Beltway Football Podcast with J.P. Finley, uh, is this. Mitch, we have seen a lot of defensive coordinators go through here uh, since I got here in 2015. You've been around covering this team longer than I have. You have seen even more defensive coordinators. What is it about the way that Joe Witt has these guys going that there are two to three interceptions per practice without fail? I know some of that is like, well, Marcus Mariota is throwing and, and he lofted the ball and then Quan made, did, did a ridiculous thing where he caught the ball behind his back ultimately. And like some of that is, is just the quarterback play. You have a young quarterback and a guy who can be a little turnover prone to Mariota. But we know that that's what this defense has been everywhere it's been with Quinn and Witt. What is it that you see that you think is the difference, even with some of the same players being far more productive than they have been in past years? Yeah, I mean, what I love about Joe Witt is the same thing that I loved about Eric the Enemy last year. I mean, I love that old school, hard coaching, enthusiastic kind of yelling. I, I think the difference, though, between a guy like the Enemy and Joe Witt, at least through a month of off season, you know, no shorts and t-shirts practices is that you see wit, you know, is intense and yelling and 
on these guys, but he's also teaching. He's also pulling these guys off the side and working with them. And that starts with, you know, the guys up front. You see him, you know, working with the, with, with John Ridgway and, and, uh, and guys like, like Fedarian Mathis, uh, as they're coming off the field and it works his way back through the entire defense. You see him with Jamin and the linebackers. You see him with Emmanuel Forbes and the DBs. And I just, I like that he's willing to kind of get involved with every level of the defense and is, is so kind of, in their faces in practice, but also kind of teaching. Whereas Eric, the enemy was a super loud voice. And I think he was more of a, at least I hope he was more of a, a teaching behind the scenes, but you didn't see him do a ton of teaching on the practice field. It was more, you know, here, do this, do that. What are you doing? It's stuff. And so I, I really like seeing kind of across the, across the group as a defense. Uh, see, I mean, the coaching staff, seeing them doing a lot of on-field coaching, which, you know, under the, the Jack Del Rio, Eric the Enemy, Ron Rivera group, you didn't see a ton of on-field coaching. You saw, you know, them kind of getting through practice, and then they would use that film study time to, to I guess, you know, make their teaching points. But to the interceptions, the obviously the Quan Martin interception today was incredible and a ton of fun and very cool. But you know as well as, as anyone, you know, when you go through these OTA minicamp practices, the first team offense goes out there, they run five to ten plays. Then the second team offense goes out, they run the same five to ten plays. Third team, the same five to ten plays. And especially as you get to that second and third string, you know, defense, you have guys who are trying to make rosters and trying to, you know, stand out. And so I think you see some guys play some of these plays not as, uh, not as, uh, real life as you might. You see guys jumping routes a little bit quicker than they probably would in a game because they don't know what's necessarily what's coming. But at the end of the day, you know, that's been the hallmark of, of Dan Quinn and Joe Witt is creating defenses that create turnovers. And I think that I'm hoping that that philosophy and the way that they use their secondary and, and DB are going to help out guys like Emmanuel Forbes and BSJ a whole lot in terms of, you know, concentrating or getting them to be in the right position to make the plays that we know they're capable of making. Uh, the the ultimate example of what you just talked about was Will Compton. Will used to have someone give him the practice script because he was like, I am going to make plays. I don't care if I'm basically cheating. I work smarter, not harder. And he would get the practice script, script and I'll be damned if, if he didn't find his way onto, onto the NFL roster, ultimately off the practice squad. And uh, he actually seemed to know what he was doing in the NFL uh, for, for a number of years, too. But he literally used to have people uh, or like find a, a coach that would give him the practice script. So that's that's probably a bit extreme, but uh, you definitely bring up a good point on the uh, seeing seeing things over and over again. Yeah, I mean, you brought up Will Compton. Is it a rule across the NFL? I don't or maybe it's just with the commanders that number 51 has to be a, <laughs> you know, a, a random white linebacker. Because you I, had I think Will Compton and then you had. David Mayo last year. Mm-hmm. This year they got Bo Bauer, who just has the greatest blonde mullet in the world. Um, at uh, who's wearing number fifty-one as well. It's been uh, it's been funny, and I've joked with Will a couple times over the years about every uh, every linebacker that wears that number is is uh, is trying to live up to his uh, uh, the, his reputation. The Will Compton Memorial number must be must be worn by a white linebacker. Uh, what a what a tradition. Some some traditions, Mitch should carry through to the new regime. All right, uh, Mitch Tischler, Beltway Football Podcast. Appreciate your time, sir, and uh, I'll see you back out here tomorrow. Absolutely. Thanks so much, bud. That is Mitch Tischler, everybody. Uh, check him and JP out on the Beltway Football Podcast. And Mitch, of course, a frequent guest on the B. Mitch and Finley Show as well over on 106.7 The Fan, which you can listen to uh, the same way you listen to us on the free Odyssey app. When we get back here on the Team 980, a quick edition of this, that, and the other thing.